everyone. Thanks for joining Just Us Chatting. I'm Tamara. And my name's Michael. And today we wanted to continue talking about this uh, Vox article um, where a feminist philosopher named Kate Mann talked to Sean Illing about uh, Jordan Peterson. Um, so we got about halfway through it yesterday, but we kept stopping. And I mean, you know. That's how we do. That's how we do. We just talk about stuff. Yeah. Just us chatting. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, just us chatting. <laughs> like and subscribe, all that good stuff. So we figured we'd go through this again today. Finish um, going through it, Finish hopefully. going through this, hopefully, you know, uh, we'll try and run through this quickly. Obviously, we're not going to agree um, with a lot of what's being said, but, you know, if there's anything really egregious, we'll just stop and talk about it. Um, and then tomorrow, actually, hopefully, uh, there's something that came out today that I was kind of interested in that I'd like to look look into a little bit today and talk about tomorrow and that is the well let's talk about it tomorrow okay but anyway <clears throat> uh, let's go ahead and get back into this this Fox article so uh, we left off kind of in the middle of this paragraph about enforcement agony um, so I'll just go back over the question real quick. Sean says, I know that Peterson received some criticism recently for endorsing or appearing to endorse enforced monogamy, in quotes. <clears throat> to be fair, this is a very particular anthropological term that doesn't imply that the government is literally forcing people into monogamous relationships, but instead refers to social policies that incentivize monogamy. What does he actually say about this in his book? <clears throat> well, Kate says, he said that subsequently, in a New York Times piece, I believe, in response to the point that school shooters are often sexually, romantically, and socially frustrated young men. This suggestion is classic straight-up misogyny according to my definition of it. Peterson has since waffled about what he meant, but I'm mostly interested in how the proposal would naturally be understood by ordinary readers, which leaves little room for charitable interpretation or plausible deniability in this case. Okay, so interested in how the proposal would naturally be understood by ordinary readers. Now, this is kind of an elitist trope, this idea that... And, and there's validity... To, okay, so there's validity to this, too. Um, yesterday I talked about something regarding, you know, the idea that intersectionality is one of those things that, like she's saying, she's accusing Peterson of, of using, you know, terminology that's not going to be properly understood by um, the, the average majority. reader. Yeah. Well, the same thing could be said of intersectionality, which turns into, you know, you know, white, straight, male, bad. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it turns into a cudgel to abuse people with. And, right. you know, if we're going to say that we can't talk about things in the public sphere because stupid people will use it wrong, then, you know, we're, we're going to not get anywhere. So right. it's, um, it's incumbent on everyone to do a better job of um, you know, articulating these views with compassion, uh, whether we're talking about intersectionality being used as a cudgel or, you know, um, Peterson's ideas of, you know, personal responsibility and, um, you know, the kind of natural occurrence of hierarchies and, and trying to keep them stable. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and alive. That's the other important thing that people don't often talk about is that you know, he's, he's always talking about updating the hierarchies, right? Keeping them al alive and vibrant and updated with the newest, yeah. you know, kind of, um, you know, and flexible to incorporate new modes of being. So anyway, um, so, okay. Uh, if she, if that's all she's concerned with, then, you know, uh, okay, maybe that's a, that's a problem. Um, Peterson's very closed mouth about the prevalence of domestic violence, marital rape, and intimate, uh, intimate partner homicide in the context of the idea of enforced monogamy. So if you're trying uh, to prevent male violence, enforcing heterosexual monogamy seems a remarkably poor way to go about it, as well as obviously infringing on women's entitlement to orient themselves towards whatever and whomever they wish, other women, multiple partners, and their own projects and ambitions. Monogamous relationships are just one potentially valid option among many, all of which have risks and rewards, costs, and benefits. Well, 
If you're trying to prevent male violence. Well, <laughs> like <laughs> what if you're what if you're just trying to prevent violence, but, you know. I mean, who's uh, <clears throat> Okay, so I, we did talk about that yesterday. Yeah. The idea that like in in societies that are polygamous, mm -hmm. you have more violence. More violence, you know, and it's and it's mostly men. What feminists tend to like not recognize is mm -hmm. that the reason that that is the case is because although women are treated as objects, they're treated as objects that are worth taking care of, mm -hmm. right? So in polygamous societies, women tend to be, because of their natural value as the limiting factor in reproduction, yeah. they tend to be incorporated into systems that will take care of them, yeah. right? Wealthy people, you know, wealthy men, landowners, this kind of stuff, right? They, they, they gather up the women, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because they can afford to take care of the women. And yeah. then there's vast, you know, numbers of men that don't have who have no prospects. prospects. Yeah. And, you know, the society, those, those kind of society, societal norms reinforce the, the justness of the fact that they have no prospects. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there's, you've got vast, vast numbers of people who are desperate. Right. Right. You know, it's the same reason that you have, you know, violence in poverty kind of go together. Right. Um, it's not, it's not like it's, you know, a particularly male problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the reason, uh, one of the reasons that violence is particularly male in, pro in, 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 um, in the real world, that mm -hmm. it's a particularly gendered problem, um, is that men are like they make up 70 percent of 75 percent of the homeless yeah you know what i mean nobody cares mm -hmm. when men are having a hard time or down on their luck it's like right. suck it up bucko yeah you know deal with it right and and so there's no there's no support structures for men mm -hmm. right so you're saying that's what creates more violence well i mean amongst men, the fact or? that desperate people become violent this mm -hmm. is true in in so you take take the classic example of a battered wife mm -hmm. Right, who you know feels trapped in a violent relationship. She's desperate, mm -hmm. right, and she ends up killing her husband in his sleep. Right, mm -hmm. it's like is that self defense? Well, or even in self. Well, right, you know what that, I mean. Yeah, is yeah. it if if she if he's sleeping in the bed, passed out, drunk, and she stands over him with a thirty eight and you That's know pops not, a bunch it's of it's not bullets I mean, into him. It's actually a tough. It's yeah, it's, it's a really tough. tough, right? It's is it justifiable? Hmm. Is it justifiable? And, I mean, and a lot of times, right, yeah. the feminist camp will say, well, of course it's justifiable. Mm -hmm. But they won't say, by the same token, yeah. that male violence in a polygamous or polyamorous society where, you know, all the, the, the hyper, the, all the hypergamous women drift up towards the upper echelons of men mm -hmm. and leave, you know, lots and lots of poor mm -hmm. men with no prospects desperate for some kind of companionship. And so then this, you know, the idea that the idea that those men are for, for the same reason that you see, you know, poverty causing violence that, right. the, you know, a, why the other th it's the other thing, too, is like if a, if a man in a society like that is wealthy, he's mm -hmm. not going to be without a woman. Right. So you're talking about poverty basically causing violence. Mm -hmm. Right. And the fact that the system of polygamy or polyamory mm -hmm. kind of incorporates all the women because they're naturally naturally valuable and mm -hmm. you know discards the men well, well the discarded men are likely to be violent that's kind of i mean there's a couple things there i mean go for it it incorporates the women that are desirable but there's still going to be plenty of women that you know aren't as desirable well but all also, women are desirable because all women, you know, I mean, they, they make babies. Yes. Yeah, but not all men want women because they make babies. In, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand that. You know what I mean? But most, like, that's that's really the point. Mm. That's, so that's why we're doing all this stuff. We're trying mm. to pass on our genes, right? We're playing all these games trying to pass on our genes and make sure that our offspring will survive. It's why we try to accumulate wealth. It's why we try to impress the opposite sex. Yeah. It's why we dress the way we dress. It's why we, you know, it's why it's it, it's what we're doing. The other thing is though, um, with the violence, are you saying that like it's somehow justifiable that 
men get violent I'm when s- there's no prospects uh, for Well, I'm saying that in a, si- in, a, in a situation where... Well, here's the thing. is It's like it's not just partners. Mm-hmm. In those kinds of societies, mm-hmm. women drift towards the financially... You know, the financially stable. Right. And then, you know, the, the, the men that are left without partners are also left without partners because they're poor. Right. Poorer, at least. Right. And so the the vast numbers of people who are both poor and it, it's not just they're poor it's mm-hmm. that the the system is entirely um impenetrable to them there's and at a certain point right this is the same thing with it's the same thing with wealth with wealth disparity mm-hmm. right at a certain point so many people stack up at zero mm-hmm. right with no prospects at all that yeah. they that they have nothing to lose so why not flip the whole thing Right. Right. And then you get you get bloody re- revolutions, this kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Right. So I'm not saying that like any individual act of violence is necessarily justified. What right. I'm saying is that it's understandable. Maybe what I'm saying is that there's there are natural consequences to certain kinds of social arrangements. What societies in this world are even polygamous? Like I know about obviously the Mormons in Utah. Yeah. Well, it but... used to be it used to be more common. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. You know, kind of the beginnings of agrarian societies and before that. And then <clears throat> it but I mean it hasn't been common for It's not, a right? Very long like time. I'm wondering if there's any other areas in the world that either allow, you know, polygamy like, you know, mm-hmm. marry, you know, you can marry multiple people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know polyamory is becoming bigger, but you still can't. You're not allowed to marry more than one person in this culture. No, it's not legally allowed. And that's another thing. I, I like. I really, I, I think that marriage should just be a contract. Mm-hmm. It should be a private contract. So you're saying that... And like, as far as the state's concerned, it should just be a contract between people. Well, isn't that kind of that's what it, it is? Well, no, the yeah, state's but it, involved. Yeah, but, it, but, it's, but it, it's a special kind of contract that's only open to certain people. Right. You know what I mean? And so I think that's wrong. I think it should just be like any other contract so that's open if, to So if five anyone. people want to, yeah. or if some guy wants to... some people want to set up a living arrangement and say, look... Because basically that's what marriage is in, yeah. in, from the state side, right? It just there's, gets more complicated. There's the religious side it's of it, which says, pretty complicated. you know, oh, we're going to have a spiritual ceremony and we're going to bind these two souls together right, or whatever, right. this kind of stuff. Yeah. That's all on the religious side. Mm-hmm. But if we've got a separation of church and state, we've got the state side of the marriage, you know, thing, which is a differentiation because it used to be that the church and the state were kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so marriage was just this thing that was, yeah, right? But now we... After the separation of church and state, marriage is one of the last institutions that's still kind of still based in the church. Yeah. Right? It's like one man, one woman, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, what we should have is churches allowed to perform marriage however they want to. And then the state is a, you know, is is the enforcer of a contract that is agreed to by Mm -hmm. whatever parties. Well, I mean, more and more states have allowed, you know, gay marriage and lesbian marriage. Yeah. Um... No, but, it's it's legal federally now, I think. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, but can't states still decide mm, no nope. if it's federal then I it think has it's federal, to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. I think <laughs> we're talking about the fact that polygamous societies tend towards more violence and mm-hmm. you're saying that, you know, we yeah. should allow that kind of contract. Well, I, yeah, because I think that because I'm a libertarian, I believe yeah. there's a difference between enforcing something. The way exactly. that Exactly. And I'll, yeah. I think there's a difference between, you know, saying, okay, this is how things should be Mm -hmm. and enforcing other people to live that way. I think we should all have the right to express the way that we think things should be, but I don't think we have necessarily that right to enforce that other people adhere to that. Yeah. So it just gets more complex. Like obviously lawyers, you know, and like in the cases of divorce or mm -hmm. like, there's just so many more things that the state would have to figure out how to like, Especially in the case of divorce, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's why basically, I think, I think the, I kind of think that the, the, the actual state kind of version of a marriage Mm -hmm. is a prenup, Mm. right? Like we've got, this has become a thing now. It's like, oh, well, marriage is, it's always been kind of like marriage is just this thing. And then like, what happens in a divorce? Well, this is the way it's always done. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just these kind of standards. And people started going, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to create prenuptial agreements, mm-hmm. right? 
And so, well, I, what about with kids and things? Exactly. You know, like, there's just like a the, lot. those things are included in prenuptials. Like, mm. If we have kids, then they get you know this, and we're going to agree to you know custody like this, and you know people include that stuff in their prenuptials, Do they? Yeah. right? So you say that's actually what the state's role in a marriage should be. Mm-hmm. Like these people agree to live by these terms, right? And in the event that they don't live up to those terms, this is the, you know, this is what they've agreed on in the, in the case of a dissolution hmm. of this contract. That's, that's the state version of marriage. Hmm. It's cold and calculating and just legal, and it's just a legal contract between people. That, you know, it's an agreement. Hmm. And then marriage, you know, is, as a religious institution, can be whatever any particular religion decides to, to call it. Yeah. You know, and then it's just a state state enforced contract on the other side. I think that's how that's how it probably should be. And that yeah. that gives freedom to you know all the people who want to have you know polyamorous relationships or anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I'm like like I said, you know, I'm uh, my favorite my favorite line about being a libertarian is you know I want to I want um, I want gay people to get married and protect their pot plants with guns you know like that's uh, that's yeah i want yeah i'm i'm all for freedom as you well know? um let's continue on yeah. this so okay so <clears throat> i agree with some of what she says here monogamous relationships are just one potentially valid option among many all of which have risks and rewards costs and benefits i pretty much agree with yeah. that but i also don't necessarily think that um, it's just, it's the same thing. I think it's kind of the same as male and female as two genders. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, basically there's kind of, there's two sexes, mm-hmm. right? And then there's gender roles that have been established over time. Mm-hmm. And some of them are biologically based, you know, uh, they've changed over time as well. You they know? have changed like, over time, but some of them are pretty old. consistent. Yeah. Like, like mothers caring for children and being more nurturing and kind of the, 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 um, the bond caused by oxytocin and breastfeeding mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's not just a gender role. No. That's a, that's like a biological, like yeah. something that's biological. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, the degree to which it manifests in each person sure is, you know, it varies. Right. Mm-hmm. Fine. But <clears throat> it doesn't mean that, men can breastfeed, Mm -hmm. right? And it kind of does mean that men aren't the best primary caregivers in the first few months. You know, it kind of does mean that. Right. You know, and so the... In the same way, I think there are traditions Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the way that we structure our relationships Mm -hmm. that are probably better most of the time. Mm -hmm. Right, and there are people who don't conform to that, and mm-hmm. that's okay, and they should have their freedom. Mm-hmm. Not trying to like shame anyone into not, you know. Well, I can't believe that you're gay or whatever. Like it, it's not what it is, you know. I don't think anything like that. Mm-hmm. But to it, it's not that they're. I don't think monogamous relationships are just one potentially valid option. Mm-hmm. I think they're the predominantly valid option. Yeah. And that there are exceptions to every rule. Mm-hmm. You know, and that those exceptions shouldn't be punished. Mm-hmm. But that they're, they're still not normal. And that's, right. you know, th- that it's okay to, th- that there are things that aren't normal. It's okay mm-hmm. that there's diversity. Right. Right. We don't have to have everything be of equal, you know, representation all over the place. It's yeah. like, well, you know. Things that surprise you are interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, things that, oh, that's different. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, that yeah. something's not normal. Yeah. You know, so anyway. Mm. <clears throat> so Sean goes on. I'll say this about Peterson. He's far more interesting than most of the gas bags currently occupying our collective headspace, but I also see him morphing into a celebrity performer as his influence grows. He's developing a customer base, and that means uh, he risks becoming more of a salesman than an intellectual. Um, so she says, as far as being more interesting than the average anti-feminist crusader goes, that seems right, but the bar is none too high at the moment. As to the populist quanti- uh, quality of his persona, uh, I think that that's already evident in his book. I've never read a book preface quite like it. He uses smiling emojis. He talks about how much his agent liked his book proposal. 
He talked about the percentage of Quora users who viewed and upvoted his answer to the question that inspired the book. Uh, and elatedly reports one comment uh, that he had won at Quora. <clears throat> Author's note, the question was, what are the most valuable things everyone should know? Um, I mean, okay, but who cares? If he wants to be truly excellent, he should aim to make the best contribution he can, not measure himself by the size of his celebrity, the idea of winning, or dominating others as an end in itself is what I tend... The idea of winning or dominating others as an end in itself is one I tend to find objectionable. That's a weird little sentence to stick yeah. on the end there. <laughs> like, yeah. And right. how is that an end in itself? Well, I mean, he's just mentioning it. like Dominating what? others? Right, yeah. How is that... Because because he did he got a lot of votes on Quora for his question like I don't no see this is the interesting thing about this okay so I've re I I've read the forward to this book and you know the the idea is what was the catalyst for this book why did this book come into being right and the answer to that is somebody asked a question of you know like hey what's some wisdom that we should all have mm -hmm. and he wrote an answer that got us like basically. All of the upvotes. Right. He, he got the most preferred answer. Right. So that the popularity of his answers mm -hmm. led to the creation of the book. So it's ex that's, that's, extremely relevant. It's totally relevant. It's like somebody approached him because of that Quora question and yeah. asked him to distill it into a book. Right. That's why the book was written. That's what the forward was about. So it's not like he's like ranting and raving about his own, oh, I was so awesome. Yeah. You know, it's like he, yeah. like, it's a forward. Why did I decide to write this book? Well, here's why. Yeah. This is the story of how it happened. Yeah. Like, it's not. <sighs> yeah. I don't understand. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's like become a performer in any particular way. Like, I don't think that he's like flouting his like celebrity no. stardom you know not that i've no i mean the only thing i've noticed is that he he tends to um mention self-authoring and yeah you know uh, pretty he mentions regular. pretty much every he time mentions he his talks program mm -hmm. in almost every a lot of the interviews he does a lot yeah. of the talks he does but you know everybody that's on tv right. or on shows well, that's, mentions that's, their <clears throat> that's also that's also because that's like part of the core of his, his work is, right. you know, um, it's the thing that they've found that so many people have benefited from. He right. doesn't like, it's not like he mentions his book in every interview. He mentions his course, which is not just his thing. It's with him and another person, I mm -hmm. believe. And I mean, it's, oh, helped, yeah, there's other people. Involved yeah. In and it's helped a ton of people. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and then the understand problem? myself too. Right. He yeah. talks about that every once in a while too. Yeah. And, uh, but but, but again, that's, the, that, that's quarter of his research because yeah. that's part of you know the big. I mean, that's actually like gathering data for you know big right. five for the big five model. Right, right. So I don't know. Yeah, let's keep going. I guess. <clears throat> the idea of I don't think oh, the other thing is I I don't think okay. So she says the idea of winning or dominating others as an end in itself. Yeah. Is one that I tend to find objectionable. I don't think that he sees winning or dominate, and I don't think anyone who's actually listened to him would make the claim that he thinks winning in and of it, you know, is, is a, is an end in right. and of itself. Yeah. Like I he, don't think he so either. constantly talks about how, you know, one of the things he always talks about is, uh, we tell our children, it's not how you win or lose. It's how, not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. Mm -hmm. And that we don't, you know, we just kind of say it because it's a cliche that mm -hmm. we say, you know, to cheer our kids up when they lose a game or right. something like this. Right. Um, but that there's some truth in there and some wisdom and he clarifies what is that wisdom it's like well the the reason we engage in games mm -hmm. is so that we learn how to cooperate and compete simultaneously mm -hmm. with other people in such a way that everyone benefits right right so winning is never an end in and of itself no in his mind and he no. says this repeatedly i mean he talks and about I mean, this all the time like one of the chapters in his book talks about like compare yourself not to others, but to who you were right. yesterday. Right. Not to know? not to who others are today, but to who, who you were yesterday. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's never it's never about winning or dominating over others, and neither the he he absolutely doesn't. It's 
it's an absolute mischaracterization to assume that he thinks um, that either of those things represent an end in and of themselves. So, moving on. <clears throat> Sean says, What do you find most interesting or challenging in Peterson's ideas, or what has perplexed you the most about how his ideas have been received? Honestly, I think the fact that he's not been called to account for saying some really eyebrow-raising, authoritarian-sounding, and even cruel things in his books. Give me an example. Yeah, please. Yeah, please do. One part of the book that I found disturbing was when Peterson responded uh, in his capacity as a psychologist to a particular client. According to Peterson, the client announced, I think I've been raped. He wrote that he immediately thought that alcohol was involved. Um, how else to understand I think so this is a, a quote from the book I guess how else to understand I think but that wasn't the end of the story she added an extra detail five times the first sentence was awful enough but the second produced something unfathomable five times what could that possibly mean my client told me that she would go to a bar and have a few drinks someone would start to talk with her and she would end up at his place uh, or her place with him uh, with him. The evening would proceed inevitably to its sexual climax. Uh, the next day she would wake up uncertain about, uncertain about what happened, uncertain about her motives, uncertain about his motives, and uncertain about the world. Miss S, we'll call her, was vague to the point of non-existence. She was a ghost of a person. She dressed, however, uh, she dressed, however, like a professional. She knew how to present herself for first, uh, for first appearances. Miss S knew nothing about herself, she knew nothing about other individuals. She knew nothing about the world. She was a movie played out of focus, and she was desperately waiting for a story about herself to make uh, to make it all make sense. Um, so, Kate Mann says, I'd raise an alternative explanation. Maybe she was raped five times, as she stated, and then was effectively undermined or even gaslit by her therapist. To be clear, I'm not saying that this is what happened. I can't possibly know on the basis of what Peterson writes here. But I'd certainly like to know more, and I'm surprised uh, Peterson has not yet been asked about these and similar passages, in which he comes across as a highly contemptuous, uh, or as highly contemptuous of female clients. Later, he goes on to say this about the woman: "Who are you? What do you do? What happened? What was the objective truth? There was no way of knowing the objective truth, and there never would be. There was no objective observer. There, there never would be. There was no complete and accurate story. Such a thing." did not and could not exist. There were, and are, only partial accounts and fragmentary viewpoints. Funnily and sadly enough, Peterson sounds like a stereotypical postmodernist here, one of his chief intellectual foes, and, doesn't seem, and it doesn't seem accidental that his skepticism about objective facts arises when it's conveniently anti-feminist. Well, um, just speaking to that, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that he like, is claiming that this is true mm -hmm. or that it's a, a good thing mm -hmm. um i think he's talking because he talks about things in developmental ways i mean i don't recall this particular passage but it seems i would imagine in this in this situation it fits with his kind of modus operandi if you want to yeah. call it that 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 he's it's it's kind of a critique of like you don't know who you are you can't find an objective truth because you're fragmented as a person mm -hmm. not because you should be fragmented as a person or because, you know, that fragmentation is the ultimate truth, mm -hmm. right? Like, because as, as a person who's unwhole, yeah. right, and, and kind of, uh, and uh, weak in some way that's not, 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 not fully uh, willing to accept the responsibility of their own agency, let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Right, um, a person who's who's not willing to accept the responsibility that comes with agency. Hmm. Right, one of the ways that we we kind of deflect our own responsibilities is by um, pretending that we're not that we're not the agent of our own experience, that we're not the creator or the you know the arbiter, mm -hmm. that we have no power. We kind of pretend. People talk about this as the you know, oh, giving away your power. Right, mm -hmm. this idea that we're giving away our power. Um, it's basically just pretending that you don't have power hmm. right same thing yeah so you know oh i yeah i don't know maybe i was like it's like 
we, we've, we've had conversations around this kind of mm-hmm. stuff in the past. And it's like, you get into these situations and maybe you're not comfortable. Right. Right. And maybe it's not what you want it to be. But you can't, you can't say that, you can't say that the person on the other side of the encounter. Yeah. Is. Has all the power has all or the power. all the knowledge about what's going on. Like, especially when two people have been drinking. Yeah. And so the thing is, I don't think Peterson's writing off what this lady said. Mm-hmm. I think that he's just unsure. And the way that he works with his clients is he tries not to, like, tell them what he thinks he knows about the situation. Or he tries not to, like, kind of... Inf- um, tries not to like force his viewpoint onto his clients, his patients, I guess. I really feel like he tries to kind of get more information and help them uncover more about right. what's going what's on in their life them. or what's true for them. Like, yeah. And so I could, I don't know, I guess I could see where she, this, this woman, Kate, or whatever, what's her name? Kate um, but it's just... I think she has a certain viewpoint about Peterson. And so I think that whenever she reads his book or listens to him talk, like she's going to extract a certain kind of perspective from Mm -hmm. what he's saying, no matter what. I just think that she's kind of like, she has her opinion about Peterson. And so she's going to like portray anything that he says or does in a negative light, almost, you know? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of looking at what she's saying pretty negatively too, but um, an alternative, you know, maybe she was raped isn't an alternative um, explanation yeah. to, uh, you know, this this kind of question. Okay, so... Because he's just questioning. He's it's, not... If somebody tells you, I think I've been raped, mm-hmm. what? how do you... You have to question. You, you have, have to, to question be like, that. well, because well if, why? Why do you, what all, happened? You know, if she thinks she's been raped, yeah, then she's saying, I don't know. The, the, you know, the, right. the kind of underlying thing there is the subtext to that is, I don't know if what happened to me should be considered rape. Right. Exactly. Right. She's, she's saying, unclear. I think it was. Like, she's not saying I was raped. She's saying, yeah. I think I was raped right. five times. Right. And it's then like, the fact that it's like okay. five times, you're like, well, wait, wait, how does that happen? How does that happen? Is that One, the same right? person? Exactly. And, like, you know, all of a sudden you're like, the, whoa. Her, the fact that she's not sure about what happened, mm-hmm. you know, it, you're kind of like, okay, well, if you're not sure that it was rape, mm-hmm. let's explore. Right. Why, why, why do you think it might not have been rape? Right. Exactly. Let's go with that. Like, what, what makes you think that maybe it wasn't? Mm-hmm. Well, um, we were drinking and we were hitting on each other and we're making out and stuff. And, you know, we kind of went back to my place and I invited him up and, you know, then we had sex and I woke up the next morning and I, I just wasn't happy about it. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, maybe that wasn't rape. Yeah. I, I can understand your confusion. Right. Right. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we got through that a lot faster than I thought we were going to. Oh, we're wow. done. Okay. That one. Do we want to move on to his response? Yeah, maybe? let's go ahead and check out his response right. as long as we're still messing around here. So we've got his response up, um, um, and I'll just go ahead and <clears throat> on June sixth, journalist Sean Illing email posted uh, on Vox. Interviewed assistant professor. I'm probably not going to read a lot of these um, in parentheses, in parentheses things, um, and and links where he's yeah offering context yeah because uh, we just read the article so and it's up so um, on June 6th, journalist Sean Ealing uh, interviewed assistant professor of philosophy Dr. Kate Mann, the feminist philosopher, about me and my work. I've decided in general not to respond to such pieces unless one they are extremely high visibility. Uh, as in the case of the recent New York Times piece, or two, they are written by a professor employed at a reputable educational institution, as in the present case. Dr. Mann works at the Sage School of Philosophy uh, at Cornell University, so she qualifies as an exemplar of the latter. After reading the piece, I wrote a letter about what I regarded as Dr. Mann's most negligent and egregious comments, and emailed it. As of today, I have received no response. The letter is reprinted immediately below, and is followed by 
some additional commentary and analysis. Dear Professor Mann, uh, you were recently featured in a Vox article con uh, commenting about me and my work, most particularly as a therapist. In my latest book, 12 Rules for, for Life, as you indicate, I wrote about a client of mine who was deeply upset about a number of her sexual experiences. Oh, he's going to start right off the bat with that one. Um, <clears throat> she told me uncertainly that she thought she might have been raped five times. You might note first that she would not have told me this if I had not already gained her trust, no matter. You claim that I wrote that she had not been subject to sexual assault in the following manner. Quote, I'd raise, uh, I'd raise an alternative explanation. My, uh, maybe she was raped five times, as she stated, and then was effectively undermined or even gaslit by her therapist. To be clear, I'm not saying that this is what happened. I can't possibly know on the basis of what Peterson writes here, but I'd certainly like to know more. And I'm surprised Peterson has not yet been asked about these and similar passages in which he comes across as highly contemptuous of female clients. However, I clearly stated, with regard to my client, 12 Rules for Life, that the interpretation that she had been raped was also uh, of potential validity, but that it was not up to me to make that decision. It was up to her, and I was not going to impose any viewpoint on her, which is exactly what you said mm -hmm. um, he would probably do. But her help, uh, but help her explore and determine for herself if, uh, for and, herself. and determine for herself. In fact, I made both interpretive arguments in the book, raped and not raped. Here are the relevant sections where both sides are represented, or both sides are presented. <clears throat> I thought I could sim simplify Miss S's life. Uh, I could say that her suspicions of rape were fully justified and that her doubt about the events was nothing but additional evidence of her thorough and long-term victimization. I could insist that her sexual partners had a legal obligation to ensure that she was not too impaired uh, by alcohol to give consent. I could tell her that she had indisputably been subject to violent and illicit acts unless she had consented to each sexual move explicitly and verbally. I could tell her that she was an innocent victim. I could have told her all that, and it would have been true. And she would have accepted it as true and remembered it for the rest of her life. She would have been a new person with a new history and a new destiny. But I, but I also thought I could tell Miss S that she is a walking disaster. I could tell her that she wanders into a bar like a, cur uh, like a courtesan in a coma and that she's a danger to herself and others, that she needs to wake up and that if she goes to single, singles bars and drinks too much and is taken home and has, a, has rough violent sex or even tender caring sex, then what the hell does she expect? I could have told her, in less philosophical terms, that she was Nietzsche's pale criminal, the person who at one moment dares to break the sacred law that the next shrinks from paying the price. And that would have been true too, and she would have accepted it as such and remembered it. You see, both sides. And you should note that I did not say these things, but was outlining them to describe two forms of extreme and opposing possible reactions. And then I wrote that I told her neither story as it was not appropriate for me as a therapist to make such a decision, but to allow and encourage the client to make the decision herself, as detailed here. Mm -hmm. If I had been the adherent of a left-wing social justice ideology, I would have told her the first story. If I had been the adherent of a conservative ideology, I would have told her the second. And her responses, after having been told either the first or the second story, would have proved to my satisfaction and hers that the story I had told her was correct, completely, irrefutably correct. And that would have been advice. I decided instead to listen. I have learned not to steal my clients' problems from them. I don't want to be the redeeming hero or the, do ex, or, or the deus ex machina. Not in someone else's story. I don't want their lives. So I asked her to tell me what she thought, and I listened. She talked a lot. When we were finished, when we were finished she still didn't know if she had been raped, and neither did I. Life is very complicated. Do you want me to read a little? Yes. <clears throat> it is not possible to more clearly state the fact that I did not dispute or agree with the rape interpretation. Let re me repeat this. It is not possible to more clearly state the fact that I did not dispute or agree with the rape interpretation. What this means is that one, you did not re read the entire section, or two, you misunderstood it, or three, you purposefully mi misrepresented it. None of those options are acceptable since you chose to go on public record. It is particularly unacceptable and potentially libelous given that you also chose to publicly criticize my integrity as a clinical psychologist 
implying, as you point out, that my client was effectively undermined or gaslit by her therapist. I would suggest that you contact the journalist and set the record straight. I would also point out that there are equally egregious errors sprinkled throughout the piece and that you might also consider addressing them as well when you make such contact. Perhaps you were misquoted, perhaps not. Sincerely, Professor J.B. Peterson. I sent a couple of follow-up messages as well. I would also say that your statement that I cherry-picked the few more dignified sounding sentences from the diary of one of the Columbine killers, Eric Harris, and that you described that as downright dishonest was also bordering on libelous, implying as it does that there, that there I am somehow expressing admiration for this man when the chapter as such describes his motivation as malevolent, resentful, evil, even satanic. Nothing could be further from the truth, Professor Mann, and it is entirely inappropriate of you to su suggest such a thing. And finally, you say, Harris, like many other mass killers, was obsessed with the very hierarchies whose importance or validity Peterson never really challenges or offers an alternative to. This is also entirely misleading, and I believe purposefully and willfully so. The main thrust of the argument in 12 Rules for Life is actually one, that hierarchies can become rigid and corrupt, that's too much order, or two, that hierarchies can be undermined and dissolved, that's too much chaos. So that three, the proper move forward is to find balance between the two. Plus, the implication is that I am thinking in a manner that is similar to Harris and other mass killers, for at least sympathetic, or at least sympathetic to their arguments. You go ahead. <clears throat> this is only a sample of the errors made by men. For example, she levies the criticism Peterson's I quote Peterson's idea in chapter six of his book that what leads to mass shootings in general and school shootings in particular is a kind of ahistorical existential angst or a crisis of being. That's the phrase he uses about the despair and misery of, and suffering of human beings. Peterson thereby takes on a huge burden of explaining why white women, people of color, non-binary folks, and so on, almost never act on our existential angst and despair in this way, because, as you know, the vast majority of school shooters have been white men. But I do precisely take on this burden. I have explained repeatedly, in a manner frequently criticized by feminists, leftists, such as men, that men, on average, score lower than women on big five personality tests assessing trade agreeableness. Low agreeableness is the best personality predictor of violent behavior of the type, for example, that is likely to result in imprisonment. Although such differences are not great at the midpoint of the distribution, so that there is only a 60% probability that a man randomly drawn from the population would be less agreeable than a randomly drawn woman, the effect of such differences are magnified at the tails or the extremes. This means that if you select the most disagreeable percentile or two of individuals, precisely those at high risk for violence and incarceration, they are overwhelmingly male. It is for this reason that there are almost 10 times as many males as females who have been imprisoned. It is exactly this explanation, higher propensity for male violence, which is not entirely explained by differences in agreeableness, by the way, that explains why most mass shooters are male. Why are they mostly white? Well, they aren't, at least not disproportionately. There's a good, article, there's a good lay article here which indicates white men actually commit a smaller number of such crimes, 54% than you would predict from the facts. One, that they are white, and two, that they compose about 63% of the male population. But man already knows the cause of such things. After all, she is a feminist philosopher and has no need to cite or even consider the facts, which are undoubtedly only a construct of the Eurocentric scientific patriarchy in any case, and unreliable for that reason. Here's the journalist's admission. Peterson has been called a sexist and a misogynist. To be honest, I'm not sure... This is a fair characterization of his work, but I haven't read his book and haven't listened to all of his lectures. I'm curious what you think. First, Illing hasn't read my book and so is unable to determine whether man's criticisms are informed or reliable. This is actually a problem. Second, he poses what is clearly a leading question despite his self-admittedly ill-informed status. Man picks up the bait, stating that if I'm not outright misogynist, I'm at least sexist. She does so because I cite the extraordinary extraordinary extensive psychological liter literature generated, let us note, by a discipline that is overwhelmingly left-leaning in its makeup, detailing differences in personality and interest between the sexes, also pointing out that societies become more equal in their socio-political policies. Fewer women, not more, enter fields that tend towards male domination, such as the STEM disciplines, and two, 
personality and interest differ differences increase rather than decrease in magnitude. Uh, I produced uh, a list of dozens of such papers here discussing James, James Damore. We won't, we won't look into that right now. <clears throat> Man simply appears to not know or not to know. He's got two knows. Ah, man simply appears not to know the literature and dismisses it with this comment. This is based more on sexist stereotypes than compelling scientific evidence. And even in the gender progressive environment of Scandinavia that Peterson mentions, it's not as if all sexism and misogyny had been eradicated overnight. Many patriarchal norms linger and are sometimes enforced or whose breakdown has led to backlash. As a result, there is currently no control group of people raised in a truly non-patriarchal culture, which is what we need to investigate claims that men naturally prefer masculine coded activities, women naturally prefer feminine coded ones. We're never going to live in a society that feminists think is truly non-patriarchal. It doesn't matter how matriarchal it becomes or how like female dominated it becomes. Right. We're never going to, there's never going to be a society that women truly find right. non-patriarchal. I think it was, <laughs> I, I think it was Karen Strawn Jesus. I was listening to who was, maybe it was, it might've been somebody, I, I think it was Karen Strawn though, mm -hmm. who was, you know, kind of laughing at the idea that, you know, the, the intersectional idea, right, is that, um, people from marginalized communities have multiple ways of knowing because mm -hmm. they're, they're forced to know the, the predominant way of knowing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but they've got their own special ways of knowing as mm -hmm. marginalized classes. And so there's, you know, kind of specialized, uh, wisdom. Yeah. Right. And I, I would say that's subtle, not necessarily mm -hmm. fundamental, but mm -hmm. it's subtle. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, you know, the claim is that because of this, they're the only ones who know when, the oppression is over, right? But it's like, well, there's a couple of problems with that. One, are they really gonna, you know? Oh yeah, we'll just, we'll just, don't worry, we'll let you know as soon as, as soon as, as soon as it's over, as soon as, uh, as yeah. soon as we're not oppressed anymore, we'll let you know. Yeah. Right. One, two, um, if you're not oppressed anymore, you lose your special way of knowing. Right. Because you're right. So like, how would you know whether or not you were oppressed anymore? Yeah. You wouldn't. Yeah. So that's kind of weird. Maybe what's happened is that you're not oppressed anymore and you don't know it anymore because you're in power. Hmm. Or maybe everyone <laughs> has a certain level of oppression <laughs> and like that's never going to go away. <laughs> There's always going to be people that treat you unkindly, mm -hmm. at least occasionally. Right. And we're never going to have a perfect society. So it's like the point is moot. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We've like, got, we've got, like we've got feminists talking about you know the way that men sit on the subway as as if it's a serious issue yeah. we've got you know we've got feminists talking about tropes in video games as if this is a real problem they're you just going mean? to keep finding it's, more and more things that they find irritating or upsetting mm -hmm. or bothersome yeah. you know what i mean they're just going to keep finding things that guys do right. especially straight white male mm -hmm. males do mm -hmm. that bother them that you know we need to fix this we need to fix that and it's just like you can it's never going to be good enough the, the the truth is i mean it's true that it's never going to be good enough mm -hmm. right um <clears throat> that's not that's almost indisputable it's like there's there's obviously no end to the project yeah. Of, you know, making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to, we have to get there together. We have to, we, you know, I mean, like, well, we also have if we to... don't get there together, then we're going to be, then we're fighting with each other and that's yeah. fractionating and that's going to make the yeah. world a, a worse place. Yeah. And maybe we need to stop looking for things to be offended by or to be bothered by. Like maybe we need to start recognizing the good that's in the world and the good that is in people and, you know, stop being bothered by every little thing that other people do, yep. especially men. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, let's just keep, let's see what he has to say about that. <clears throat> so I think his, his, he's going to have a, a similar tack that we did, which was, um, true. so he says, true. Let me go back to it oh. in the browser. He says, true, there are no control groups. Uh, of people raised in a truly non-patriarchal culture um, and who would define what that is even in principle which is a good point yeah 
but there is overwhelming evidence that societies become that uh, as societies, societies become more egalitarian, with Scandinavian countries serving as case in point, men and women get more different, which is a consequence that is precisely the opposite to what Dr. Mann insists must be the case. Here's the issue. As you flatten the socioeconomic differences between the sexes, the playing field, let's say, <clears throat> then the biological differences have the opportunity to maximally manifest themselves. It's not what any, anyone expected, including the researchers, but that's what happened. And to call that sexist stereotype is simply not a response appropriate to a professor of philosophy at Cornell. Finally, in what is probably the most egregious comment in a piece littered with carelessness and willful blindness, man takes me to task for waffling on what I hypothetically meant in the New York Times by enforced monogamy, which I clarified in detail here. And we'll leave that alone for now. The New York Times journalist misrepresented me in a rather treacherous manner, given that an infinitesimally tiny proportion of the time she spent interviewing me involved the issue of, uh, in, of forced monogamy, and knowing full well that, I, that what I meant was enforcement by social norm. In any case, I do believe and state forthrightly that monogamy is a universal social norm, though not an absolute, and that, and that is because, too, the social arrangement provides women and men with optimal partners, stabilizes society in a broader sense, particularly compared to po uh, polygamous cultures, and sets up a comparatively reliable environment for children. There is nothing the least bit controversial, controversial about any of this, unless you are a doctrinaire radical, the sort likely to characterize your ideological indoctrination and lack of familiarity with the relevant psychological and anthropological literature as, quote, feminist philosophy. Hmm. Scathing. Oof, that last <laughs> little... He hits hard when That last people, little sentence there people, was like, oof. When people punch hard at him, he definitely... Yeah. He doesn't... He doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold back. Nope. And nor do I think he should. I mean, he's a very intelligent human being, and he deserves the right to yeah. <laughs> defend himself. And also, especially <clears throat> when people misrepresent what he said, which yep. they do constantly. Oof. So. That's the problem. I mean, they just... One of the biggest things is there's, there's obviously, uh, you know, kind of a heterodox opinion. Mm-hmm in higher education um and a lot of people say it's because um well this is a you know a classic trope is that liberals are smarter <laughs> and that's why you know the the academy leans left mm -hmm. um it's not true mm -hmm. um and i think it's <clears throat> probably more um, reasonable to look at it in terms of temperament. Mm -hmm. um, the most risk averse people in the world, mm -hmm. right, are going to be those seeking tenure <laughs> at a university, mm -hmm. right? What do, what do I want to do with my life? I'd like to think about things, mm -hmm. you know, and study stuff. Like, these people aren't, they, they don't want to risk yeah. anything. Yeah. They don't want to upset the apple cart. No, they're not looking to, you know, I mean, they may want to discover something new. Mm -hmm. They may be driven to like, you know, yeah. in, in, in that way, but they're, yeah. they're, they're not like, they're not risk takers. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so. So you think the vast majority of them just kind of go along with the general... Uh, I Main, think like I th line of thinking. I think that there's safety in numbers, mm -hmm. and that um, they tend toward they tend towards collectivism, mm -hmm. um, and that there's a well. Of course, there's there's they're kind of there's also the development of the green meme. Okay, mm -hmm. but but the way that it expresses like it's not that the green meme only expresses itself in um, academia, right, right. There's there's corporations like Whole Foods, mm -hmm. you know, um, that are private sector expressions of that same thing. There's right. little, you know, uh, there's there's hippies selling soap, and mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. you know there's yeah. lots of there's lots of private sector expressions of the green meme. Right. What makes the um, 
what's different about the university set is that, well, there's a couple things. One, they're getting guidelines um, from a federal system that incentivizes basically this kind of um, collectivist thinking. Mm. So you get <clears throat> you get Title IX, right? And the way that Title IX is interpreted is this is the other thing about le legislation and, re uh, and regulation that people don't seem to understand. When you put a regulation into place and it's not extremely clear, yeah, right? Corporations go <laughs> and like just like they do. They try to cover all of the bases to keep themselves from getting in trouble with the yeah. federal government. Yeah. Right? All organizations do this. So mm -hmm. even private institutions and private colleges, uh, private universities, but especially state-funded universities, state universities, they see, okay, well, all of a sudden there's like this justification for or incentive to, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you could call it a negative incentive, right? It's like, it's like a fear-based incentive. It's like... It's kind of vague, and it's like, okay, well, we, we want equality for women. It's like, whoa, that's pretty, you know, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> as, as you start to kind of interpret that, mm -hmm. um, especially through a postmodern lens, mm -hmm. right, you say, okay, well, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough? Are we doing enough? Because it's vague. Yeah. Right? So there's an explosion in the last like three decades of administrators and most of them are in you know campus life mm -hmm. uh you know providing support and services for um for marginalized communities women and you know it, it's it's a lot of um it's protection mm -hmm. right it's 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 nerfing they're the there whole to world. like mitigate risk you think oh yeah, yeah they put these administrators in place so that they can so that they have plausible deniability right and say look at all the look at all the work that we're doing to you know yeah. to try and prevent these these harms right so that so that when they get accused of being racist or when they get accused of being sexist they can show all the ways that they, right they can they yeah. can look these are all the things that we're doing right mm -hmm. they've got all these things in place to to show that they're trying to but adhere. now but now the problem is they've actually been kind of it's a seed right? well you plant that seed then you Okay, so here's all the things that we're doing, and then these these little you know administrative bodies start preaching <clears throat> this kind of postmodern intersectional mm -hmm. doctrine. But now right? they're almost oppressing white males. So now, like there was, I don't remember what school it was, but there was a school recently that you know got sued, or people were wanting to sue them because all the scholarships were only for women. Yeah. And they weren't giving any scholarships away to men. This is coming out now. And yeah. so now it's like, you know, they, they tried so hard to, you know, give women a shot, an extra shot. I don't know. And, and mar other marginalized groups. But now they're marginalizing white men. <laughs> well, this is interesting. Um, I've been, you know, my I've been learning things uh, from my um, gender studies professor recently. Um, Karen Strong. Yeah. <laughs> On, on, um, she is brilliant. I mean, she's she knows smart. this is her whole life. She looks into all this yeah, like, so, constantly. Um, what's I was listening to actually this morning, and she was talking about um, disparities in education. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that at the turn of the century, around the turn of the century, the 19th century, or the 20th century, I should mm -hmm. say, early 1900s, yeah, um, the um, percentage of the population uh, in the, in higher education yes. was six percent of the population of the male population and five percent of the female population. I thought it was six and seven. So, well, it, Something it, like that. Off by one. Yeah, yeah. One percent difference. Mm -hmm. you know, one percent disparity between men and women in the um, and and I don't remember which was, but it's close. I think it was seven percent men and six percent. Women. women okay so yeah. it was close it was like barely off like right. barely like any right disparity yeah. and then um what happened was uh, and that was pretty much the way it was and mm -hmm. you know more and more people got in but then um as kind of a reward for being drafted into the first and second world wars mm -hmm. um, men were given the gi bill mm -hmm. and so because women didn't go into combat in the first and second world wars, they didn't have 
the government giving them money to go to college. Right. And so there was a bump right. in the number of people, men that were in college. Right. Um, and then in the 80s, after the draft stopped from Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, and it was, you know, that went through part of the 70s. But after the end of the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. everyone kind of came, who was drafted came back um, and, you know, had kind of gotten through their, their college. Mm -hmm. By the, you know, in the 80s, it was back to pretty much even again. Yeah. Um, but by that point in time. Uh, feminists in the 60s and 70s had made such a row about the disparity mm -hmm. that we set up all these establishments to make sure that women were getting um, plenty of plenty of what, funding, scholarships, funding to... and scholarships. Yeah. And, and they framed the fact that men were being rewarded for going to war and serving in, in, in war um, as as oppression of women, basically. That's that's what it amounts to, right? Is that like there were a bunch of extra men who were in college because they they'd been fed to the meat grinder of war to yeah. protect the country and to, you know defeat the Nazis or whatever, yeah. right? And and so they looked at they looked at the disparity and and this is the other thing that feminists tend to do repeatedly, constantly, mm -hmm. is they see disparity and they go, ah, that's that's oppression. Like disparity is not the same is not evidence of depression right. or of, of, of oppression. Of depression, yeah. You know, so they see this disparity. You know, oh look at all these. You know, look how many more men there are in, um, in college. It's like, mm -hmm. well, look how many more men died in war. Yeah, these you know? guys actually lucked out. Like they were like, of this, the few that actually. So survived. this is this is her. This is you know this is kind of Karen's thing. She was talking about. She's like I. She says through the history of of, of feminism, what I see is. Women wanting the same goodies as th that men get mm -hmm. without the responsibilities that they, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yep. so it's like, okay, well, men are going off to war and when they come back because, you know, some of them came back, mm -hmm. not all of them came back and all of them had to deal with war. Right. All um, of them were scarred. At, you, you know, know? The, the people who went out, went to war and, you know, fought in trenches and, you know, lived through brutal winters in Baston and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Well, even in Vietnam, that was oh, like God. just as horrific. It was horrific, and terrifying, and very and scarring, because they're like and, fighting and, like, in jungles warfare. and oh. like areas that they have no idea how. Like how yeah, to you'd be move walking down these... a path, and there's like people like two feet away from you, hiding in the bushes, yeah, waiting to pick off the guy, tra you know, at the at the at the back. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, terrifying. Yeah. Like just on edge the whole time. Yeah. Terrifying. So these men. You know, there, our nation decided. You know what? We're gonna be, we're gonna reward them with money to go to college or start a business and, and this should. kind of stuff, <laughs> right? And so there was a period in time where there were a lot more men in higher education mm -hmm. because they were being rewarded for having sacrificed their life and limb. You know, yeah. or at least being willing to. Yeah. And then that was read. Mm -hmm. You know, by the feminist community, as look at this horrible oppression of women who yeah. aren't getting to go to you know how, how come we're not getting to go to go to college? How come yeah. there's so few women in college? It must be because men are keeping us out, right? And this is the same thing that we saw like in uh, when we saw um, another thing she talked about was how there were feminist organizations that were panicking over the increase in um, women's uh, increase in women's death at like oh, work, workplace, in the workplace but fatality it rates. But it wasn't actually an increase in women's workplace fatalities. It was a decrease in, in men's. Their men in the male. And so the, yeah. the so the proportions but they, seemed but they like were oh my god. It, they were viewing it from you know proportions proportions and right. Yeah. And so there were there were you know in two thousand eight there were massive layoffs all over the place as the you know the economy kind of restructured, too big to fail and all that. Yeah. So there are massive layoffs all over the place and lots of companies shutting down. And because of that, and, there were and because less of that, there were a stats. lot less men who had, you know, being crushed by heavy machinery and logs and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and so the purport and, and women whose, um, you know, who, whose uh, actual workplace fatality rate stayed even. Mm -hmm. um, well, by comparison to the right. number of men, seemed like they were making up more, uh, like a higher percentage of, 
of of workplace fatalities and yeah. that again was seen as oh god you know like yeah. we got to do something to protect women it's like it's whenever whenever there's some sort of advantage or benefit that men get yeah feminists come along and interpret that as oppression of women right right i think they all just need to stop bitching <laughs> <laughs> fucking grow up <laughs> Well, it's hard, but it's hard to see though. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've got to give them that. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're in the sixties, seventies, mm -hmm. right. And what you're seeing is data on, you know, college attendance and it's, you know, skewed towards the men by, you know, a significant right. margin. It's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to. Well, it shouldn't be, but it, it is. It's I mean, hard they, to the thing is, they're looking the at they're looking at just kind of like the surface level information and not thinking about like, well, let's see what could be the reason that men are yeah. seemingly it's true when, you know making up a higher proportion of right. college students. It's true. It, you know, it, like people a, need to stop looking at just like the basic bare facts. And actually, like, looking into things before you start crying oppression. Right. You know, or whatever. Well, that's the thing. I think that there's a, there's a, there's a really significant um, bias on the left to, to kind of jump to this narrative, kind of a Marxist narrative of oppressor versus oppressed. Yeah. You know? That there's always a victim and a victimizer. Right. There's, there's a, you know, that, that all disparity is the result of some, you know, kind of criminal, you know cabal yeah of of powerful elite people or something like and it's this. not and it's, that simple like i'm not, not saying that there aren't people who flout the rules or you know oppress people but it's not as simple as people it's like it's not like there's just like the bad people and the good people we right. all have our issues we right. all do things that are less than great you know um, but I think people need to stop like saying that they're victims or that, you know, telling people that yeah. they're telling other people that they're victims and these are the victimizers and, you know, you need to stand up against these people. It's like, I, it's not that simple. It's, no, it's like, not. it's not but as the, simple the as thing is, here, here's the interesting thing about this, the way that it kind of plays out. It's like postmodernism is, is kind of rejection of grand narratives, right? Yeah. So like the idea that. You know, science holds all the answers. Well, obviously it doesn't. You know, and or or religion holds all the answers. Well, obviously it doesn't. Right. Communism itself is a grand narrative. Obviously, it doesn't hold all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, so, th what's what's interesting about post you know this kind of postmodern rejection of grand narratives is that um, you can't you can't motivate social change without a grand narrative. Mm. Like you've got to have some. This is the, this is what politics is. You've got mm -hmm. to like reduce problems to sound bites mm -hmm. that a bunch of people can get behind. That's true. You know yeah. what I mean? It's got to be like um, uh, black Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus, of course. Yeah. Right. What a what a what is? I mean, of course, right. obviously. Right. Right. But it's also quite obvious to anyone who's paying attention. That that's not all they're saying. Like right. there's there's a lot to that, mm -hmm. right? That's like the that's the here's here's what you know here's the stamp that we're putting on it that everyone can get behind. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's underneath that. That's you know that it's yeah. a much more complex movement. It is. Right? It is. And not and everyone within that group all have the, the same, same mindset. Right? Like some of them are kind of extreme like you know yeah. in any group there's right. some people that are quite you know at the extremes yeah. and it's not just black lives matter it's like you know screw all the screw white people because right, right. you know they sure. suck and they've been oppressing us and there blah, there blah, are blah. those and there are those who um you know there's there's so those people exist and mm -hmm. they may or may not be the majority of a movement mm -hmm. you know any given movement um you know but the the point is that you actually kind of like this is where postmodernism gets weird. You actually mm. need a grand narrative, mm. right? The 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 kind of dissolution of all narratives or the deconstruction of all narratives doesn't actually give leave anyone with any kind of motivation or motivating force. It doesn't create change. Interesting. Yeah. It doesn't drive anything. It just takes apart 
all the momentum. Yeah. Right? So you might say, well, maybe white we should deconstruct white nationalism. It's like, fine, yeah. I don't mm. necessarily think that we need a lot of white nationalist momentum in the world. Mm-mm. You know, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not down with that. But, mm-hmm. right, um, conflating everything that is Western society with white nationalism right. and then deconstructing all of it is not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And then when when you do that and you're deconstructing everything, what you end up with is all sorts of, you know, all sorts of other narratives kind of popping up. And basically, you know, the narratives that are acceptable on the left are Marxist narratives. Mm-hmm. It's oppressor versus oppressed, mm-hmm. right? And so that Marxist narrative provides a narrative framework for social activism. Mm-hmm. Postmodernism provides the critique and the deconstruction Mm -hmm. and Marxist and the Marxist uh, dynamic provides the, the, the motivation. Hmm. Right. And so that's, that's where the whole like postmodern neo-Marxist thing comes from. It's Hmm. an unholy alliance, you know, obviously Marxism isn't, uh, is a grand narrative. And so it's, you know, antithetical to postmodernism, but postmodernists, you know, don't necessarily care about consistency <laughs> because they don't believe in grand narratives. Right, right. You know, they don't believe that there is such a thing as a consistent narrative. So, hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this kind of like weird dichotomy there mm-hmm. when you get all these, you know, kind of postmodernists that deconstruct everything. They, they're, they're in a place where when you deconstruct everything, there's no motivation. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. You you, you, have, you become nihilistic. But you need a grand narrative. You need a narrative to move forward. You like again. We were talking about yesterday. Hierarchies. Of, you know, there are hierarchies. Mm-hmm. Right. If you dissolve all the hierarchies, there's nowhere to go. So you have right. to have a hierarchy. Right. So what's the easiest way to set up a hierarchy? Well, you look at you know, especially on the left, mm-hmm. the easiest way to set up a hierarchy is there's bad people and we're good people. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you go, okay, there's the oppressor people and we're the oppressed people. Yeah. Like those are the those are the Right. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's the motivation is as old as, I mean, it's, it's older than humanity. You see like dogs fighting over a bone. It's like, Mm -hmm. there's the dog that has the bone. Let's get him, Mm -hmm. you know, and a bunch of dogs will, you know, gang up on the one dog with the bone, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) it's like, it's, it's a really, really ancient motivation. Yeah. You know, get the guy with more stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, tear him apart and take it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's, that's about as. Yeah. About as ancient as you can get when it comes yeah. to like motivations for Hood, action, right? Robin Hood kind of. I wouldn't even say Robin Hood because mm. one of the fallacies about Robin Hood is that Robin Hood stole from the rich to give to the poor. That's mm-hmm. not really the case. The rich and the government were uh, were kind of synonymous mm. in those days. Mm. So it's more accurate actually to say that you know he stole from the government that mm. was taxing people. Right, that was the whole story. Robin Hood, right? The sheriff of Nottingham was abusing his authority yeah. and taxing people into yeah. poverty. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel and like that's was, what's happening. Now right, and so he was stealing and the all, tax and money then, back. And then the people on the left, a lot of people, he was on the giving left, them their money back. Yeah, hell. you know. <laughs> all right, we need a we need a modern day Robin Hood. But um, I mean, all these people on the far left want want to tax people upwards of seventy percent. Yeah, seventy percent. I'm like, it's like already that. insane the amount that we're being taxed. Well, that's okay. So, so to be fair, the proposal is a you know, it's is probably a, for is wealthier a pro- people. Yeah, it's a progressive. Right? It's a progressive tax where you know the rich get taxed the, up to seventy yeah. percent when you're making you know. I still don't agree. Over ten I, million dollars or something like yeah, this. Yeah, I still don't agree. I don't want. I, I think I like the idea of a flat tax. And a smaller percentage for mm-hmm. everyone, you know yep. what I mean? Because, like, what I don't want to like de incentivize people to like work hard and make a good living. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? I don't. I don't think that you know you should be penalized for being wealthy. No. And therefore have to give away a ton of your income. No. You know. Anyways, nope. I know I digress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let's see. We're at like an hour fifteen. About all right. Well. Yeah. Um, that kind of actually leads towards what I was hearing about, or uh, what I was reading about. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Tim Poole, um, I heard about uh, Subverse, which is this group, I think, on, on the Minds platform, which I haven't really looked into. But they're, um, he's, he's involved with a group that is going to be doing, or is planning on doing a kind of distributed newsroom, where they will have um, 
it's a network of people who will be reporting on the ground around the world. They'll be mm. doing video and kind of submitting videos. Um, at least that's what it seems like. And, and so through um, Subverse, I found this video today um, about a leftist group called, uh, well, it wasn't just about them. It was, it was, it was about um, kind of leftist anti-fascist protesters who um, kind of were going to counter protest uh, a white nationalist rally in, I think, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the case or not, because I wasn't paying attention to where the white nationalist rally was going to be. But, okay. um, but the basic idea is these guys are real legitimate white nationalists mm. and um, with a history of violence, mm. um, and they got shut down. You know, um, the, they, they didn't get their permit. Uh, the state or the municipality rejected their permit to, to have the march, and so mm. they weren't going to have um, police protection, and uh, so they didn't do it. And they mm. were still talking about rescheduling it, but this leftist group showed up. Um, they were originally going to show up as a, as a counter-protest, mm -hmm. um, but they showed up, uh, oh, I think it was called FLOWERS, was the, was the acronym. Mm. I can't remember what it was, but... So they showed up... And they showed up and down? they showed up and um, they well they originally were going to show up as a counter protest mm -hmm. but after they were denied their after the right wing group was denied the permit they showed up um, and they kind of held a celebratory march um, and you know more power to them uh, yeah. that's fine what was a particular interest to me was that there was a group you know it's a it's a coalition flowers is like a, a coalition of various groups antifa communist liberals whatever. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but there was a group in there um, called Redneck Revolt or the John Brown Gun Club, um, which is seems to me like a left kind of like a left wing equivalent of um, Oath Keepers or maybe the Three Percenters or something mm. like this. Um, you know, they're they're um, working class people. Uh, it, seemed like maybe predominantly from rural areas, more mm. rural areas. Um, and there was a guy in the video who, uh, was, who they talked to, who was part of the group, um, who made some interesting points. Uh, he said, you know, that there's a lot of the people in the Redneck Revolt or in the John Brown Gun Club, whatever you want, I don't know. I, I, I may be... Talking, I don't know anything about this yet. Like I said, I want to look into this a little bit and maybe talk about it more tomorrow. Um, but <clears throat> he said that it seems like uh, maybe a lot of them are from um, rural areas where, you know, genuine white nationalism and racism and the Klan and stuff like this are still um, a significant problem. And there's a, there's a significant culture... Um, around that in in a lot of these areas and so these guys um, if they're from those areas um, and they're standing up in this way uh, I have a lot of respect for that um, you know and he, he said something about the uh, he, he mentioned the idea that um, the fact that the, most of the liberals are in urban areas in the cities mm -hmm. um, they he said they've, they've kind of gotten because they haven't because people in cities haven't seen this stuff, right? Right, and they haven't been seeing it for such a long time. There's more diversity. People like many, many people, and you know, almost everyone in an urban area knows people of other races, hangs right. out with people of other races, yeah. and so this kind of this kind of um, uh, general racial ignorance and mm -hmm. and kind of division isn't as prevalent, prevalent. and yeah. so they haven't seen this stuff. They haven't been paying attention, mm -hmm. um, and and so they kind of like stopped caring about it or talking about it or fighting it. And, um, and so, uh, so anyway, it's just, it's just an mm. interesting group. I'm actually really, um, you know, I'm, uh, part of me is kind of excited to see leftists, um, engaged with the idea of individual responsibility, gun ownership, and the, you know, kind of necessity of individual gun ownership in political freedom yeah you know i'm just kind of interested to check them out you know cool. it's like it's like um you know i i, I kind of it like the the fact that there are 
you know, the Oath Keepers, mm -hmm. which, you know, purports to be nonpartisan, but mm -hmm. they lean right, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like, yeah, okay. But to see it on the left, yeah, that's I'm kind of like, strange. okay, I'm, I'm interested, yeah. you know, like, like when, and not that, I, I don't know, I don't want to say um, Maj Touré of Black Guns Matter, I don't, I don't know that he's a leftist or, a, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think he, I don't think of him as necessarily a leftist. Maybe but more he's libertarian. He's more left, I think. Mm. I wouldn't call him a right winger for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and and so I'm I'm always interested to see, you know, um, I'm just kind of. I appreciate it when I see. The left integrating, personal individual power like that. Yeah. It's yeah. like you are an individual human being and you have a right to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and to be armed and to stand up against oppression as a person. Right. Not as a group. Yeah. But as a person. Mm -hmm. You have a responsibility and a right to, you know, to stand up and and um and and be a force in the world. Yeah. I'm like, wow. That's cool. You know? Cause it, it's really the group it's really the the kind of group identity stuff that puts me off the left. Yeah. So when I start seeing, you know, leftist groups talking about you know, your right to own guns. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, now we're talking about something, right? Mm -hmm. This is like like radically individualist in yeah. a way. It's like you as an individual. Even though they're a, a group. Right. Sort of, but I mean. But, but I mean, the, but the ideals they're expressing are, you know, they, they have to, by almost by necessity, be more individualist because mm -hmm. it's like you have the responsibility for this, like, it's this weapon. Mm -hmm. You have a weapon now. Mm -hmm. You have to have. You have to be responsible with this weapon. Yeah, you have to right? treat it with respect. You have to treat it with respect. You have to like. You know what I mean? It's like it. 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 It emphasizes your role as an individual. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're holding a weapon, your your role as an individual is is emphasized. Yeah. Because you you're you're taking on personal individual power. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to have the responsibility to go along with it. So it's really. Uh, it, you know, it's a radical act yeah. and it's a radical kind of, um, anyway, I just, I, I like to, I like to see that kind of stuff on the left too. Yeah. And, and I mean, sure. They make me nervous the same way that, you know, the, the three percenters make me nervous when they talk about, you know, seven, 1776 will rise again, this kind of stuff. Mm. And it's like, well, okay, uh, yeah. here we go. You know, like they're, they're, you know, groups of militant, revolutionaries with guns are scary right you know they're, they 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 make people nervous but i sure. i believe in america and i believe in individual liberty and i think that as a society um it's the right way to be and so you know freedom's not always comfortable and i right. and and you know the fact that there's people on the left who make who've got guns that make me nervous isn't mm -hmm. any different than the fact that there's people on the right with guns who make me nervous so sure. um i'm i'm interested now in kind of I want to check it out. Yeah, we'll you know? have to look into that. To check them out a little bit, see what they're about. I, I like. I, I looked at their website, um, redneckrevolt.org, and they got like this bullet point list of things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. At the top is you know we, we stand against white supremacy. I'm like, all right, well if that's your number one priority, cool, that's fine. Yeah, you know, and then you go down the list and like down halfway through it, there's like we're anti, you know, we're against capitalism. I'm like, all right, well you're stupid, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. at least at the top of the list, I agree. Yeah, you know, sure, it's fine. Sure. <laughs> don't have to agree with everything don't have to agree with everything right but like you know so I wanted to look into that and check them out but we started talking you know as long as we got we kind of got off off the whole straight feminism Peterson thing and started yeah. talking about other kinds of politics so yeah. maybe tomorrow um, you Talk know about talking about gun rights talking about gun gun rights and you know the, the interplay of left and right wing ideologies and and um and the right to bear arms. Yeah, maybe. Okay. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, Twitter, YouTube. Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Just us chatting on all of those platforms. Um, that's it. Good afternoon. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow.